When the keeper brought his family to live at the light, their young black dog came to. She loved the keeper and was always by his side, and she learned what keepers do. She watched over the children when they played close to the shore, and hung out in the kitchen hoping food dropped to the floor. And she howled with the foghorn when she saw the wall of fog. She was truly a lighthouse dog. She's a member of the family in this lonely remote place. She's a friend, a companion, and more. And she always has a way to put a smile on your face. She's the lighthouse keeper's dog. She's alert. For visitors she can bark out an alarm She can smell a gale coming before the keeper knows She hunts and digs for rabbits, often scolds the gulls And she helps to keep the garden dug even when the digging's done The years pass by and her muzzle turns to white On wobbly legs she still follows the keeper to the light her eyes long dimmed of light still search the horizon And her ears still listen for the calls of distress She is always there to listen and give comfort to the sad A friend and companion every keeper wished he'd had The light of devotion still shines in her eyes As truly as the beacon in the tower on high She's a member of the family in this lonely remote place. She's a friend, a companion, and more. And she always has a way to put a smile on your face. She's the lighthouse keeper's dog. Hi, I'm Russ Franzen, and uh, I write and sing songs about Great Lakes history. And today I'm going to do a little bit, uh, well, almost everything, uh, because I write songs about, about uh, lighthouses and lake boats and shipwrecks and people and, and life along the Great Lakes. Well, life along the Great Lakes can be a lot of things. And I'm going to do a couple of things today with these. But first I want to uh, sing this song. Um, this song is about... Well, it's based on some of the things that Elizabeth Whitney Williams wrote about her time as a lighthouse keeper. Elizabeth Whitney Williams was a lighthouse keeper in her own right for 43 years. And she was first um, uh, keeper at uh, the St. James uh, Harbor Lighthouse up on Beaver Island. And she was there for 12 years. And for 29 years, she was at the Little Traverse Light. And when she, when she retired, her kids wanted her to uh, write her memoirs, and so she did. And uh, unfortunately, there is only, well, only a fraction, maybe, uh, maybe two-tenths, maybe a quarter of the book was about her time at lighthouses. The rest of it was of her time growing up on Beaver Island during the time of King Strang, which was very interesting. But the time that she spent talking about the lighthouse work, it was, it was very emotional. You could tell that it was very important to her. And that's why I wrote this song. It's called The Keeper of the Light. A light keeper lives on rocks and shoals, far away from our neighbors' homes and farms. We listen to the sound of the seagull's cries and the beat of restless waters under starlit skies. But the passing ships are like old friends of ours. We know their shapes and their whistles calls, and we know their hearts are cheered when they see our light. When the waves are angry on a stormy night, the keeper loves his lighthouse like a sailor loves his boat. It's grand and noble work, filling sailors' hearts with hope. He guards a lamp with his life to guide lake sailors through the night 
and prays that the boats that pass this way will pass this way again. As you lie in your bed all snug and warm, there are sailors on the lake battling a storm. They tremble on the deck in the midnight hour as we trim our lamp in the lighthouse tower. We stand in the glow and watch the waves roar as they rise, chase, and tumble upon the shore. We hear canvas slapping in the winds of the gale and pray those sailors will live to tell the tale. The keeper's life is hard with work the time we pass. We keep lens and windows clean. We paint, we polish brass. We light the lamp at sunset. That life-saving light And keep the wig trimmed evenly To keep it shining bright The keeper loves his lighthouse Like a sailor loves his boat It's grand and noble works Filling sailors' hearts with hope He guides a lamp with his life To guide lake sailors through the night and prays that the boats that pass this way will pass this way again. Now, sometimes it's hard to find things to write about when you're writing Great Lakes history because there's so much. Every boat has a story. Every sailor has a story. Every lighthouse. And every town has a story. And uh, back in, I believe it was 1977, I was working at a small radio station in southern Illinois and uh, across the UPI ticker. Those of you of a certain age who worked in radio or television know what I'm talking about, those great big teletype machines. And uh, a story came over the ticker that folks in a pr place called Grand Marais, Michigan, wanted people to send their pet rocks up there. Now, the pet rock craze had been over. Those rocks were just sitting on shelves and taking up space. And the folks in Grand Marais, well, their harbor of refuge, the break wall, was breaking. Sand was coming in, filling up that harbor. And they couldn't get the Army Corps of Engineers or the state of Michigan or Congress to do anything about it. So they decided to take it into their own hands and have a pet rock funeral. And this is the story, Pet Rocks to the Rescue. I'll tell you a story of a red letter day on Superior's shore in Grand Marais. Twas a day when the citizens of that small UP town stood up to Uncle Whiskers and stared the old boy down. There's a harbor of refuge on Superior's shore at the village of Grand Marais. But the breakwater wall was breaking and the sand was filling the bay and they needed some help in a very big way. But in Washington town, the government men wrung their hands, you could hear them say, we'll spend money on a study and do it today. And the problem you have will just go away. So way, hey, Grand Marais, it's pet frocks to the rescue. If the Army Corps won't help us, we'll do it our own way. We'll load a boat with pet rocks and bury them at sea. It's a tea party demonstration, throwing rocks instead of tea. So the call went out to America, send your pet rocks up our way. We'll use them to build up the breakwater at the harbor in Grand Marais. In civil disobedience, they buried all these stones. Then by person and by boat to the breakwater they rode. But the Army Corps was angry. You can't go throwing stones. It's against the law. We'll arrest you. It's a thing we can't condone. But the burial went on as planned to stop the sand invasion. If the government won't help you, it will take them out of the equation. So hey, hey, Grand Marais, it's pet rocks to the rescue. If the Army Corps won't help us, we'll do it our own way. 
We'll load a boat with pet rocks and bury them at sea. It's a tea party demonstration throwing rocks instead of tea. The uh, breakwater wall eventually got fixed <laughs> just a few years ago. <laughs> As the steamer Shenango locked through the Sioux, two men on her deck were seen. One said to the other, you tall more oar on a ship with a broader beam. That man was James M. Schoonmaker of Medal of Honor fame. And two years later they built that ship and gave to her his name. In October 1911, she started her maiden trip. And Colonel James M. Schoonmaker stepped aboard his namesake ship. In the grill room he looked up through the skylight of glass and he stayed in a state room furnished with mahogany and brass the world's largest great lakes freighter no longer someone's dream her three coal-fired boilers turned the water into steam as she pulled away from her moorings on that calm october morn she whistled a parting salute to the workers on the shore. Her hull wore a gown of green, she was the queen of the inland seas, and from the first time she sailed from Toledo, the records fell with ease. She set a speed record that October from Duluth to Ohio, and the records fell for flax and wheat, rye and coal and iron ore. She sits today in layup, no more the waves to fight. She'll never again sail into Erie, past Toledo Harbor's light. But she's still alive at anchor for everyone to see. The Colonel James M. Schoonmaker, still Great Lakes royalty. Looking out for other ships and shoals and things that sailors dread. The wheelsman at the wheel and the watchman eyes ahead. The mates overseeing all the painting to be done. Day in and day out on every Great Lakes run. She took all the lakes had to give her, be a calm wind fog or gale. Like the white hurricane in 1913, a storm that made all the others pale. She was sold in 1969, changed her name, her colors too. She retired as the Willis B. Boyer on the Maumee in Toledo. I walked past her the other day, her engine's silent now, and I wondered about what her crew had seen from the portholes on her bow. After 69 years of service, she rests at anchor now. The freighter is now a museum ship at the port of Toledo. With the higher level bridge on her stern, downtown Toledo off her bow, her great holds empty caverns, will be evermore. She may not sail the lakes again, but a laker she'll ever be. The Colonel James M. Schoonmaker is still Great Lakes royalty. She sits today in layup, no more the waves to fight. We'll never again sail into Erie, past Toledo Harbor's light. But she's still alive at anchor for all of us to see. The Colonel James M. Schoonmaker is still Great Lakes royalty. When I think about life along the Great Lakes, I think of baseball. Because baseball is something that I have enjoyed all my life. The first time I glimpsed Lake Michigan 
I grew up in uh, suburban Chicago. What is now suburban Chicago is just a little farm town back then. But um, the first time I saw Lake Michigan was from the upper deck at Wrigley Field. <laughs> now you can't see it now because they've built up so much along there, but back in those days you could see Lake Michigan and sometimes you could see some boats out there. And it was really, it was really special every time I went there. Um, I'd go up there, just take a look at the lake. Well, I've been a Detroit Tigers fan now for probably close to 40 years. And, and uh, saw many games at uh, Tiger Stadium. And after I got married, I got married, I think, uh, the year that they tore down Tiger Stadium. And uh, my wife Ruth had never been to Tiger Stadium. She wasn't a baseball fan until I turned around to the game. And uh, so we were members of an expat Tiger uh, fan group called uh, 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 the Mayo Smith Society. And at their annual meeting every June, they meet and they have lunch and they have speakers and, and so forth. And then, at, uh, uh, then afterwards, they go across the street to uh, Comerica Park and and watch the ball game. Well, the one year we were there, I think it was 2011, um, we were riding up, uh, going up to Toledo, uh, going up to Detroit from Toledo, and Ruth said to me, she said, I want to stop by where Tiger Stadium used to be. And I said, no, you don't. And she said, uh, <clears throat> yes, I do. And I said, look, all it is right now, it's just a vacant lot and the grass is probably overgrown. There's probably garbage around the fence line. I said, you don't want to see that. And she said, yes, I do. So we went. And when we got there, I parked over by the lumber yard. And uh, I was looking across the street, and I couldn't believe it. Is it I, didn't, I thought I was in the wrong place. So we got out of the car, and we went over and stood by the fence. And the grass on the whole field was cut. The infield was groomed. There's a pitcher's mound there. You could have played ball. And on the center field flagpole, there's an American flag flying. Well, I went and told the guys at the Mayo Smith Society, I was telling the people at my table about it, and one fellow said, oh yeah, he said, there's a group over there called the Navin Field Grounds Crew. And they're the ones that make that happen. He said a couple times a month, they'll go over there, they'll put their, their uh, uh, um, their um, uh, lawnmowers, put them over the fence, climb the fence, and uh, uh, somebody will, you know, pick up garbage and and they'll they'll uh, uh, make the field look nice, and then they uh, and then they uh, uh, go play catch or hit the ball or maybe play a pickup game until the police tell them it's time to go home. They have to go home they're trespassing and he, the guy smiled and said but the police never tell him to go home until it's all done so so anyway while everybody else that evening was watching the tigers play the pirates i was writing this song it's called the park at the corner it looks like a park just like grass and dirt and a chain link fence to keep people out just a vacant lot in Detroit City on the old Chicago Road. But not long ago it was a different park where men played a game made for boys. And every summer for a century the crowd filled this park with noise. Bluegrass still grows on the infield, pace pass still the same, and like the old flagpole out in center field, our memories remain. Time moved on, the team did too, to the ball. 
It's only a building, some people said. Then the walls came tumbling down. From the dust it rose to the dust returned. Now a field in the open air. But the grass on the infield is still cut to play by people who still care. The bluegrass still grows on the infield. The base path is still the same. And like the old flagpole out in center field, our memories remain. Now here's one more baseball song. And uh, I got the inspiration for this song back a few years ago. I think it was in 2015, roughly there. And... Um, of course, Toledo is the home of the Toledo Mud Hens, the uh, Tigers AAA farm, farm Club. And there's a fellow playing over there named Mike Hessman. Now, he played for the Tigers for a little bit. He also played for the Mets. And, but mostly, he played in the minor leagues. And he was coming up on, he was just a few homers shy at that point that I was watching, of the AAA all-time home run record. And I think pretty sure he was 38 years old might have been 36 but I think it was 38 anyway he's too old to be a ball player in some people's minds but there he was and he was playing good third base he was hitting the ball he's hitting singles doubles you know he was doing a fine job and yet I was watching him play on that August afternoon and I was thinking to myself you know he's playing well but they're never going to call him up again to the major leagues. And I was feeling bad for him. But then I thought, wait a minute, he's 38 years old and he's still playing baseball and getting paid for it. <laughs> How many of us would like to have that? And so, so I didn't really feel sorry for him, but there was a bit of melancholy there. And I thought back to some other old ball players that I'd gotten to know briefly over the years. And uh, they all had one thing in common. When I talked to him, <laughs> I wasn't 30 or 40 years old. I was 10 years old. I was still a kid when I was talking to him. It's called the ballparks of my mind. He sat alone at the bar. When I saw him, I knew his name. The last time I saw him was at a baseball park. Hitting homers brought him fame. I asked if I could join him, he said, if Jim Beam joins us too. And we traded by and drank some like baseballs, the stories flew. He told me of the long balls, some of the farthest I'd ever seen. And of chasing legendary pitchers and swings that brought him to his knees. And about the old ballparks that history's left behind. But I still see the big guy in the batter's box In the ballparks of my mind They were some young child's hero For what they did with a bat and ball They brought joy to our springs and summers Sometimes into fall But the ball players get old And the kids grow up in kind But our heroes stand tall in the batter's box In the ballparks of our mind Stopped for a cup of coffee. There were donuts in the case. His work day nearly over when I came in at lunchtime late. He poured himself a coffee and greeted all of us inside. And the donuts were as good as the baseball talk. My trip was worth the ride. My boyhood hero standing there telling stories he was wired. He had flour up to the elbow. Once through balls of fire, his playing days long ended. But none of us forgets the blazing fastball, the scary curve, and his heroics with the bat. They were some young child's hero for what they did with a bat and ball. 
They brought joy to our springs and summers, sometimes into fall. But the ball players get old, and the kids grow up in kind. But our heroes stand tall in the batter's box, in the ballparks of our mind. He steps into the batter's box like a thousand times before. He's an old man playing a young man's game, wearing minor league decor. He played a few years in the majors, but the pitchers showed no fear. But in the minors, he could hit the long ball. He's a hometown hero here. The fans come out to see him, but the scouts don't give him looks. He can still hit the ball out of the park, his name atop the record books. One day soon he'll hang him up, but he'll always have a story. For those grown-up kids who watched him play, their hero he'll always be. They were some young child's hero for what they did with a bat and ball. They brought joy to our springs and summers, and sometimes into fall. But the ball players get old. And the kids grow up in kind, but our heroes stand tall in the batter's box, in the ballparks of our mind. Well, thank you. I'm about out of time, and I'm going to play one more, one more little song here. And uh, it's a blessing for each of you. And... Uh, tell you it was a blessing for me to be able to to spend this time and play a few songs for you and I hope we have this chance again and uh, hope I'll hope I'll see you around Michigan may blessings flow upon you may your journey be pleasant and sweet may good fortune walk beside you and spread happiness to all you meet all the best we wish for you this day. May each minute bring delight. This boatman bids you a good, lovely day and a restful sleep tonight.